It was, in the fictional words of author Tom Clancy, the sum of all fears. But the December 8, 1964, live nuclear weapons accident at Bunker Hill Air Force Base outside Kokomo, Indiana, was very real. Five operational nuclear weapons, including, for some time, the most powerful live nuclear bomb in the U.S. arsenal, lie burning in the wreckage of a Convair B-58 Hustler supersonic strategic bomber. One crewman is dead, two more are burned, and the accident, which occurred at the height of the Cold War, is seconds from spinning out of control into an unimaginable nuclear calamity. Only one man, part of a team at Bunker Hill Air Force Base, was specifically qualified to respond to the fire that burned with five nuclear weapons inside. His name is Roger Craigs. So, Roger, I think the first question people want to hear about is, what's it like to be the man who saved the world from nuclear catastrophe? I think saved the world from nuclear catastrophe. I had a lot of help. I was a part of a very large uh, Broken Arrow incident with our bomber. Now, it's it's interesting you say that because anytime you talk to somebody who's played a role in, as you say, a team that responded to some type of an incredible tragedy, and this is one of the worst in military history, perhaps, um, they always credit their teamwork. But you had, you were one member of the group that responded to this emergency that had a qualification that no one else had at the time. Isn't that correct? That's correct. I was the only uh, person in our squadron that had been trained to operate a particular piece of equipment. All right. And, and what was that? That was a steam jenny, is the terminology. Any vehicles that went into the contaminated area, when they came back out, they had to be cleaned underneath with uh, wheels, tires, and the bottoms of the vehicle uh, to eliminate radioactivity. But you were exposed... Spread. You were exposed to the radiation. Yes, I was. Wow. Any lasting effects? Problems? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, probably the, the single question that I think people want to hear an answer to about this accident is that now, now we've got a fire burning on an aircraft next to a runway at Bunker Hill. There are five nuclear, live nuclear weapons in this fire. Could those weapons have detonated? Certainly. They, they could have, there could have been a nuclear detonation, detonation. Yes, that was possible. What would have happened if there were? We wouldn't be having this conversation. Did, I think that's not, that's an, <laughs> that goes without saying. I think that's an understatement. Um, there would have, you know, this would have almost, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say it would have changed the arc of history. What, what do you think would have been the, the, the literal and figurative fallout from a giant nuclear explosion from an accident like this in the Midwest? It's hard to say. Um, a lot of variables involved in that. And I, I really don't know the answer to that. It's, well, I, it's a difficult question. Were you... At the time this happened, were you scared? I mean, there's a fire, one man is already dead, two are burned, here are these five nuclear weapons in the middle of a fire, and how close did you get to the weapons? 20 feet. You were 20 feet away from these live nuclear weapons. I was in the area, I was, I was further out most of the time, but I got as close as 20 feet. Were you afraid? No. How can you not be afraid? Burning nuclear weapons. Well. This would happen in 1964. I was stationed there from 1961 on, and we were a primary target for the Russian missiles, uh, especially the ones in Cuba. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were probably a number one target at that point, and you just learn to live with that and do your job. You're trained to do a job, do it. It's about basics. It's incredible to consider that you accepted the risk on such a global scale. I mean, it was more than just your own lives. It was much bigger than that, it seems. It doesn't seem it was much bigger than that when you're talking about a global nuclear war. Yeah, it, it, 
would have been a whole lot different if uh, something would have happened. Uh, I go back to time in history there where from 61 to 65, uh, that's back in the day when they're building the Berlin Wall and President Kennedy was the first uh, presidential candidate to be broadcast on TV. And <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, Alan Shepard went into space for the Americans. Uh, Russian Gagarin, uh, they, they had already uh, achieved orbit at that point. And uh, just the uh, way it was doing business. In 1962, we had the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And that was 14 days. That was a lot more dangerous than working on a burning bomb, uh, in my opinion. 1963, we had uh, President Kennedy was assassinated, and everybody uh, tightened up for a few days, but to just doing things. And then this incident, December the 8th, 1964, um, when it happened, uh, tough time putting out the fires and it uh, would sit there for a while and then it would burn again and nobody seemed to know why. But the initial uh, initial accident time, uh, there was a lot of activity on the base. There were people yelling to get the airplanes into the hangar so that they're not damaged if we have a, an explosion. And the other school of thought was Get the planes out of the hangars because if it blows up and the hangars fall in on them, so uh, it was a very, very busy time. How did the accident, uh, in your recollection, how did this accident unfold? You've got these five nuclear weapons in an aircraft fire at the side of the runway. How, how did that happen to begin with? Uh, the plane skidded off the runway, uh, icy conditions, and we may have been going faster than we should have because we were participating an operational readiness inspection, and the purpose is to get all planes taxied uh, so many minutes apart to get scored its path. So uh, it was unfortunate when they slid off the runway, the gear caught, and there was some information on uh, Facebook, that, or not Facebook, on the internet that uh, I would politely disagree with when they slid off the runway. The uh, bottom fuel tank on the B-58 was only like a foot off the ground. And when he went over the edge, came down on the tank, ruptured the tank, the fuel tank, and uh, the one of the landing lights on the runway uh, must have arced or sparked and caught the fuel on fire. And the rest was uh, no good news after that. And the largest bomb carried on the, the largest nuclear bomb carried on the B-58 is carried directly in proximity with the external fuel tanks, and the two are right, they're right yeah. on top of each other, literally. Right. There, there are two components, and a matter of fact, that's the name of the pod, is two-component pod, TCP, and the, the warhead was right in the top of the fuel tank. So that's that large, long pod that we see right. on right. the center line mount of the right. B-58 external fuel pod, nuclear weapons container on top of it, the two component right. pod. Exactly. And that hit the runway and ruptured, the mm -hmm. fire started, fire et cetera, started. et cetera. That's my opinion. All right. Um, you know, your perspective is unique having been through this emergency and also having been through the Cold War both. And considering that the country today, this accident was, you know, many, many decades ago, now, almost 50 years ago. 56 years. 56 years ago. When you compare the United States today and the things we've been through recently where we consider the pandemic and racial unrest and the divisive political environment, would you, see, would you suggest that uh, since the Cold War ended in 1991 that there has been any threat to the United States as large as the nuclear threat during the Cold War. Well, I think now is more dangerous. Everybody's in the game now, and they're not as uh, as stable, in my opinion, as we were. Our generation was uh, relatively stable, dedicated, disciplined, and all that. And today, everybody has something to say about something, and uh, I believe there's a lot of loose cannons out there. 
literally and figuratively, you know, there's more countries with nuclear capability than part of the And, you know, we kind of threw this interview in with a quote from the fictional author Tom Clancy, but interestingly enough, maybe a good way to wrap it up is that in one of Tom Clancy's books, The Sum of All Fears, um, he writes that the characters are not worried about the superpower that has a thousand nuclear warheads. They're worried about the outlaw who has one. So perhaps that remains our greatest threat. That's true. I haven't read the book or anything, but I would say that's a fair assessment. Well, you know, interestingly enough, you don't need to read Tom Clancy because you lived it. <laughs> so to you, <laughs> it's nonfiction. And I'll tell you, it's a, it's a privilege to work with you and, and speak to you. And, and I thank you very much for relating this insight into what is one of the lesser known, but certainly the most serious incidents of the Cold War. Roger, thank you very much. Thank you.